Today on the bench I have an Ingersoll Rand 2850 Max-6 Air Impact, the Dash 6 denotes that it has the 6 inch extended anvil on it. This guy is going to get a complete rebuild with a brand new tune-up kit from Ingersoll. They have all the basics you need in kits like this to get this thing in tip-top shape, assuming nothing's actually broken. And as far as I can tell, nothing is, but we'll take a better look at it once we get it apart. The tune-up kit part number on this is 2850MAX-TK1 for tune-up kit 1. I got it through my largest tool distributor. I do not know who else sells these kits. My part supplier does not, so I had to go through my distributor for it. Uh, I, I don't know if you can find them online on Amazon or someplace. I'm sure you can. I just don't know anyone offhand that does that because I only uh, have to shop as far as my distributor will take me or my part supplier. So let's take this thing apart, clean it up real good. Then we're going to go over everything soup to nuts to make sure it's all working okay. And then I'll go over how to actually install the new tune-up kit. I just gave this to once over with the air blower, a strong bristled brush, and a pick to get in all the little screw heads where there's a lot of buildup. So now that it's at the point where we can at least start working on it, there's some electrical tape wrapped around the end of the anvil. Let's take that off to see what lies beneath. I don't know why all that was on there. Maybe they were trying to retain a socket. I don't know. But that's what this hole in the anvil is for. You put a pin through that to keep the socket on. So I don't know what that's all for. It doesn't look like there's any damage. So I don't think you're trying to repair something. Next, we'll remove the handle from the rear. There's four six millimeter hex screws holding that in place. I'm going to bet that these are torqued down pretty tight. So I'm going to use a long handled ratchet with a 6 mil hex. I might have to put this in the vise to stabilize it, but we'll see if we can get it doing it this way. The handle is what has all the air channels for the trigger and the speed control and the air inlet. We will disassemble this. I think everything's held in there with either screws and or some roll pins. I haven't had one of these handles apart before, so we'll discover that together. Move the old gasket. And then pull. the rotor housing out. So contained inside here is the rotor or the motor, which is the thing that spins, that drives the anvil on this. And that slides right out. There is a plate in the front. We're just going slow here because I haven't had this particular model apart before. So we're just kind of learning as we go. In the front's a bearing, which you would expect to see. And then this plate, there's a wear plate on the inside. That all looks fairly normal. And here is your rotor and the rotor vanes. I don't know what these circular things are. That's the first time I've seen a rotor design like this. I've had a one-inch Ingersoll apart before, and it did not have whatever these round things are inside the rotor. We're going to look all this up though, and we're going to refer to the schematic for this to see what exactly everything is that we don't understand just yet. So that's kind of cool, something new. In the meantime, 
You can drop the veins out of the rotor. We're not going to need these because they're going to replace those. In the back is a snap ring that retains the rotor inside the housing. We'll just remove that. So this should just slide right off the, the rotor now. There it is. Look at the inside surface of the rotor housing to see if there's any gouging or score marks in it. That looks pretty good. Bearing in the back here. We'll try to remove this by using a pick to get inside where that seam is between the bearing and the shoulder on the housing. I use a 90 degree pick that usually does the job. Sometimes these things are particularly ornery, but this one is not. Just slide that in there and then it just pulls right out. There's the bearing. This one is not is not shielded, so it can be repacked. And it feels pretty smooth. And there is now your bare rotor housing. Let's look at the rotor. We want to see if the surface is here are in good shape. They look a little discolored from some scorching that happens because this is not well lubricated. I doubt that this thing has ever been maintained or properly serviced over the years. I was trying to see if whatever these round things are, if they move. No, they don't. I have no idea what that is. Are they weights? I don't know. If someone's had one of these apart before, and you know what these are, tell me. In the meantime, I'm going to look them up. Let's take the front apart. This bearing should pop out as easily as the other one did, so I'm going to use the pick again. Yep, pops right out. Good. There have been some instances where these bearings are, are press fit, and they go in very, very difficultly, and come out with a lot of difficulty too. Sometimes you have to use heat, sometimes you have to really get in there and start to tap them out, but these come out nicely and they feel pretty good. On some models, this cover on the housing is just a rubber sleeve that goes over it. I can't tell if that's the case here, but there is a gasket here that's gotta come off, so we'll pull that gasket. And then, okay, then the plate comes out. So this is not a sleeve, this is actually the, the portion of the body where everything goes in. So this plate comes off. There's usually a separate wear plate inside of these, so let's see if we can get that out. This one may not have a separate wear plate, so that might be one piece that's supposed to stay in there. I can't get it out initially, so again, we're going to find out by looking at the schematic if that should be disassembled any further. Up front here is the hammer and anvil assembly. And that just slides backwards through the hammer housing. And this is a conventional design. Two hammers in a cage, held in with two pins, and the anvil just sets inside of them. You see the same exact design on the 3 8 and half inch and three quarter impacts. There are some one inch impacts that have a different design than this, but this one is as conventional as they come. And usually you just have to twist the anvil a bunch of times and it'll come out past the hammers. There we go, just took a little wrangling. These dogs on the hammer, uh, on the anvil is what the hammers strike against to drive this. And while we have it apart, we take a quick look to see if there's any damage, but that looks pretty good. And then we just push these pins out of 
the hammer cage. And then the hammers slide right out. Note how the hammers come out of this cage because this is very important for reassembly. The hammers are identical, but they are put in here opposite each other. The top one here has a thin or narrow slot on it. The hammer on the bottom has a wide one. If we turn this around, we're going to see the opposite. The top one has a wide one. The bottom one has the narrow one. And if you were to separate these, you'll see that they in fact look identical. I like to say that this looks like a ghost with his hands up. When you put this back together, one ghost has to be upside down when the hammers go on top of each other so that you have one narrow slot on top of one wide slot. And that's critical to how this is going to push against the hammer. So make sure when you put it back together again, you have them lined up properly. In the meantime, we're going to look these over, make sure they're not cracked or broken. They look pretty good. Put those aside. The hammer cage also looks pretty good initially. All this is going to go in the parts washer and get thoroughly cleaned. We're also going to remove all the old lubrication from the hammer housing. And some of these have a bushing piece in here. On some that's a bushing right there. On others it's an integral part of this. So we'll see if that comes out in the parts washer. In the meantime we'll remove all the heavy grease with uh, some paper towels, get it cleaned up as much as we can, and then send it through the parts washer. Most of the parts, except for what's in the handle, have been disassembled and cleaned. I found some rust on the wear plate, which does come off of that front plate. Some rust on the front plate and some rust on the rotor housing. So we're going to spend some time de-rusting that. And then as far as the handle is concerned, I'm going to do this separately because this is its own assembly with its own parts in it. So just for organizational sake, I'm going to take care of the main parts of the tool, get those all re cleaned up, re-lubricated, and reassembled, and then we'll work on the handle by itself.
We'll start by reassembling the rotor assembly and inside of the repair kit is a cool little chart that's pretty helpful on the cover there. It gives you all the, the part numbers and the descriptions of what they are. I do have a copy of the schematic, but it's cool to have something like this which helps you as you go to give you information on the subsets of parts that you have. So the first thing we're going to use here is the new vein set that goes inside of the rotor. And we're just going to check to make sure there's nothing else I'm overlooking. They give us new bearings, that's nice, so we don't have to repack the old ones. This is for the handle assembly for the air inlet and the valve, so we'll put that off to later. And then it gives you some new gaskets that we'll put on either side of the rotor housing. So first, we'll use the new bearings and the new vein set. These already have grease in them, but we'll pack it better. We'll put more in because we got a lot of grease. The grease that I use is the grease that has been recommended to me by an engineer at Ingersoll Rand, made specifically for their air tools. This is the 105 grease. Grease does not go in the rotor housing, it goes on the bearings and it goes on the assembly in the front. Oil goes in the housing for the rotor. So just remember this, grease in the front, oil in the back, except if we're talking about bearings and stuff like this, these get greased. So oil goes inside of the rotor housing. We'll put a couple of drops down there so that when the rotor comes to seat in there, it'll have a cushion of oil beneath it. And then the spindle with the groove for the retainer ring goes in the back and comes out through the bearing. And now we reinstall the retainer ring. When you put these snap rings back in, take the extra second to make sure it seats properly in that groove. It should spin when you apply a little bit of force to it, and this does. And that's how you know it's correct. If it's not seated correctly and it pops out later during operation, then you have to disassemble everything. Things could break. So the ounce of prevention you take now is worth a pound of cure later. Flipping this over, we'll oil each slot and insert a new vein. This should spin freely. Those veins should slide out of their slots and rest back in there. There should be no resistance. That feels good. Next is the front plate and the wear plate. Just put the wear plate in the front plate and the holes that are in both will line up to match. Like that. These holes go over the holes here in the rotor housing. And then the front bearing goes on. So we're going to pack this guy and just slide it on over the spline drive. Next, we take the assembled rotor housing and put it in 
the body sleeve. I think the way you make sure you get this right is on one end of the sleeve is this large rectangular tab with a little pin coming out of it and that lines up with this slot in the housing and the hole up here goes in that pin. Uh, do we not do the point yet? I got my order of operations wrong. Don't put the plate on yet. And then the sleeve goes over the rotor. Okay, do that. And now you can put your plate on. Now that's correctly assembled. And all your screw holes should line up. It's You, you can't put this in wrong. So if something doesn't fit right, just take a second and look because it should all go together only one way. This is the handle gasket. This one's the hammer case gasket. Handle gasket goes on the rear and obviously then this one goes on the front. And because this has holes cut out in it and it has little tabs on it, you can't put this wrong on either. So just orient it correctly and it sits nice and flush. And then the hammer case gasket also has tabs on it, so it sets in there, but I don't think there's an upside down or right side up. It just fits over the plate. And sits flush in there. We'll set that aside because next we're going to do the hammer and anvil assembly and then we'll make the two assemblies together. So we'll start with the hammer cage and the two hammers. As I mentioned when we removed, uh, when we disassembled this, one of your hammers has to be facing one way and the other facing the other way. So one ghost with his hands facing up, the other ghost doing a handstand, hands facing down. When you put these on top of each other, one narrow slot goes against one of the wider slots and the same is true on the other side. Grease these up really good on all surfaces. And then, I'll show you now just because it'll be covered in grease and harder to do later. Once these are all greased up, you slide them in the cage with the slots going to the side and then we slide the pins in. The pins go through those slots and hold this whole thing together. Now the hammers are held in with the pins, but don't stand this on end or the pins might drop out and then the hammers will fall out. So keep this horizontal and we'll set this, uh, we'll set this right here so I can show you now inserting the anvil. Grease up the dogs in here really good.
and then just do the reverse of when we disassembled it and insert the dogs into the hammer assembly. You're gonna have to jiggle it to get it past the hammers. So just wrangle with it and manipulate the hammers and it'll eventually just drop in. But there's a few random acts that have to happen for that to occur. But you'll get there. Just hang with it. There. And you know it's right when that flange on the anvil is flush with the hammer cage. Next is this whole assembly goes in the hammer housing. We're going to give it a final coat of grease on the outside of the hammer assembly. Next, we mate the hammer assembly up with the rotor assembly. In matching this up with the hammer housing, it doesn't matter its orientation as long as front and back are correct, and that is a spline drive here is going to mate with the spline drive in the hammer housing. So just make sure of that, otherwise it doesn't matter its orientation because it's symmetrical. To hold this assembly together, I'm just going to stick the screws in there. The screws aren't going in their final positions yet because the handle has to be there because the screws go through the handle. But I'm going to put this here to keep the assembly together and to keep dust and stuff from getting in the parts that we just cleaned and lubricated. Everything's held in here with either screws or roll pins. So we'll start by taking the grips off and access the trigger. That's held on with four screws. I think they're torque screws. I believe they're T10s. Well, the years of gunk that have built up in there, we're keeping these two together. A little bit of prying took care of it. Just shows what a few years of buildup can do in keeping stuff stuck together. With the grip panels off, we can now access the trigger. And that's held in there with a pin. And the trigger pops right out. And there's the pin that holds it in place.
There is a pin in here. This is called a stop pin. I don't think we're going to need to further disassemble this, but that O-ring is getting replaced. And this is important. Uh, what fell there was a ball detent or detent ball. And that is to keep the knob in the position that you select. So don't lose that. See that ball sets in those detents there. And as I check the schematic, there is also a spring. Here it is, fell out there. This spring keeps pressure on that ball. And there's a hole here opposite this stop pin. There's a hole where that spring and ball goes. Yeah, I'm going to have to take this over to the vise and clamp it in there to do this. So sit tight. There's your two roll pins. And the assembly, I think, should slide out. There it is. Now in here is a, a whole sub-assembly consisting of some O-rings, a spring, and a ball. And they come off in some particular order here. Try to figure this out. This O-ring comes off, and then that ball comes out that's held in with a spring. And then there's an inlet screen down at the bottom that sits back here. I'm just not sure how that all comes out yet. There's a row ring. And this is all one piece, so I'm not sure how that ball comes out. We might have to go into the back and remove the screen first, because there's not a way to get that out from this end, so it's got to be from this end. I have to unscrew the fitting from the inlet, and that's going to take some work. So i got to go back over to the vise and take a good size wrench to this. I didn't say anything ahead of time because I would have been embarrassed if this didn't work. In order to get this screen out, I had to jerry-rig it. I do not have a hex bit the right size for that. But what I found was that I could jam a 3 8 drive extension in there, clamp this in the vise, and then put my ratchet on that and I was able to unscrew this successfully. So the spring comes out and then the ball comes out too. These are all the parts that make up the air inlet. The only thing that's left in here is this plunger. I'm not sure how to take that out. There is one pin left here. So let's pop that pin out and see what happens. I doubt it's going to release the plunger. because the plunge is not that long. And I think all this pin is is a stop pin for the trigger. So if you put the trigger back in there, then this part comes to rest up against that pin. So I think that's all that does. It just keeps the trigger from moving too much. I don't think that has anything to do with the plunger. I don't know what's retaining the plunger. There's nothing on the diagram. Maybe it's just held in there. I'm gonna try to pull it out. Oh, that just slides out. It's just getting held up by a little friction in there. So with the exception of the stop pin now, that's a complete disassembly of this handle. Let's put it through the parts washer, get it cleaned up. Let's take a look through the rest of the parts in the tune-up kit to see what we have to replace and what we can dispose of. It's going to get a new ball. A new inlet spring and a new screen with a retainer. They give you a new retainer ring for the anvil, which means there should be an O-ring with it here somewhere. That would be one of these two, probably the larger of the two, I'm going to guess. We'll find out. Gives you a couple of O-rings. 
Oh, a new retainer ring for this for the uh, rotor. We already used that. We reused that. A new. Oh, this is for um, replacing that that indicator pin in the housing that you line up the plate with. We didn't take that out, so we're just going to leave that out because we don't need to reuse that. And then three pins. These are all roll pins, and these will be replacing. These will be replacing the three roll pins that held the reverse valve and the air inlet in. And finally, we have the diffuser for the exhaust. The diffuser for the exhaust just slides. Let me show you here. That just slides right in here. There was not an old one when I took this apart, so. And that doesn't have to go in all the way because there's a recess to accept it here in the handle. So as far as it will go, and then you're going to have a little sticking out, I believe. And that's a problem. We can cut it. No big deal. For the air inlet, the ball goes in, then the new spring goes in, and then the new screen with the retainer. They give me two slightly different sized O-rings without telling me which one goes where. Just by eyeballing it, I believe the smaller one goes on the reverse valve and the larger one goes on the air inlet. Well, the two roll pins go back in here to put the air inlet in. I got to put this in the vise to grip it. I, <laughs> I'm an idiot. I thought I had the camera plugged in, so I wasn't going to take over the vise, but I don't. I'm operating on battery power, so we'll show you just hammering these pins back in what it looks like. Hold on to your tools. And there's your roll pins in place, holding this assembly back in. And now we'll put the reverse valve back in. So we'll have to play around here and figure this out. Just to make sure it's oriented properly first. 
It goes in like this because this stop pin rests up against the cutout in that brass bushing in there. So it doesn't really matter, I guess, uh, how it goes in as long as you have that stop pin where it needs to be. All right, well, after telling myself to be careful when the ball bearing comes out, I lost it on the floor anyway. And just took me 20 minutes to find it. Okay, so a little bit of lube on the O-ring here to keep this moving smoothly. And that turns nicer now. And then the roll pin, that's what it is, goes back in there. The trigger goes back in the slot in the handle and let's make sure it gets all lined up properly by being sure that the hole in the trigger is lined up with the hole in the handle so we can put the pin back in. And after I said to make sure it got lined up I just nudged it out of the way so I got to try to back this out and do it again. And I think the handle assembly is now complete. Let's just look around and make sure. All right, now the handle assembly gets made back up with the main housing. Alright, put the gasket back in place. Put the handle in place. A little bit of Loctite on the screws and we'll be in business. I'm not tightening these screws just yet. I'm just put, keeping them in place so that everything stays together. And I'll tighten them once I'm sure everything's lined up right. B 
because we're tightening two gaskets between these assemblies these screws have to be tightened sequentially and progressively so I'll do it in a cross pattern starting at my lowest torque setting and working my way up and then finishing them off by hand And finally, we'll put the D-handle back on. It doesn't matter necessarily where this goes. Just that if you're right-handed, you can use the trigger with the right hand and hold your, the D-handle with the left hand. So I'll put the D-handle on the left side like this. One last thing is to put a new retainer clip on here. There is a specialty tool for that from a company called Just Clips. And they make specialty pair of pliers that do a great job of taking those off. And they also have a plate for installing them. I do not have the plate to install the one inch ring. So we'll see if I can just stretch it out a little bit with the pliers here and get it on. You have to be careful not to stretch the ring beyond its capacity or then it won't be elastic and spring back. So we'll take the old one off anyway and then see what we can do with the new one. And then you can take the O-ring out that sets underneath that. That's not always easy to do. <clears throat> No rings on. We are complete now. And I know the big finish would be to hook this up to the compressor, pull the trigger, and hear it and watch it go around, but I do not have a fitting for my compressor to go on a one inch gun. So it's gonna to have to wait till I get it to the shop this week, hook it up to the air compressor, and make sure that it works okay. And if it doesn't, I'll take it back and keep working on it. But everything went to back back together very smooth on this one. There were no hiccups at all. Rather straightforward. So it's easy enough to take apart, put back together again. I think it was even easier than doing some of the half inch ones that I've wrangled with in the past. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please keep watching because I've got more tools in the haul videos coming, as well as a flyer drop video that's going to take us through the end of the year. So do me a favor, click down here now to subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, use a tool, don't be one. <laughs>